All right. In this video, we're going to see our last scheme for delegated computation. It's going to be a very interesting scheme, very different from the two previous ones that we saw. It's going to have one main advantage, which is that the verifier will be completely classical, no quantum requirements on the verifier. And it's going to have one main inconvenient, which is that instead of interacting with a single quantum server, we'll require that the verifier has the ability to interact with two spatially isolated quantum servers. So let's see how this is going to work out. Here's the setup. We have our usual verifier, a description of a quantum circuit and an input to the circuit is to compute the value of the circuit evaluated on the input. And for this, it's going to delegate the computation to a server or a prover that has quantum capabilities. And in this scheme, we'll make the assumption that the verifier can talk to two different provers such that these provers are spatially isolated they can't talk to each other, but they might be sharing quantum entanglement. So these provers could have an entangled state. In fact, the honest behavior of the provers in the protocol is going to require them to share a large number of EPR pairs. And when I consider this honest provers that might be cheating in the protocol, I'll allow them to share any arbitrary entangled state that they might want. So that's the setup. And the question is, how do we achieve delegated computation? What's the protocol like? It turns out that it's a little bit complex and I'm not going to be able to give you all the details, but there's three main ideas that go into the protocol and I want to highlight each of these ideas. So the first idea is an idea that we've seen already. We're going to use the CHSH test, the CHSH game, in order to force these provers to share a large number of EPR pairs. So this we know how to do. It's a part of the protocol that's completely independent of the verifier's input, we just have the verifier play many of these CHSH tests with the provers. So this is going to be a sequential interaction. We send bits, receive bits, and these bits uh, are generated and checked as in the CHSH test. And the outcome of that part of the protocol will be that we have a guarantee that provided we check that the provers satisfy the CHSH condition about 85% of the time when we perform these tests, then whatever they were doing, remember these rigidity results that we saw about the CHSH test, whatever they were doing must have been locally equivalent to measuring EPR pairs using the CHSH measurements. So Pauli's X and Z and Hadamard shifted Hadamard for the other prover. Of course, we'll do this symmetrically. So we'll exchange the role of the provers so sometimes prover 1 is playing Alice, sometimes prover 2 is playing Bob, we're telling them which role they're playing. And so this is essentially the key step of the protocol, because the idea is that these CHSH tests are letting us gain leverage, control over the kind of qubits that these provers act on, they must be halves of EPR pairs, and the kind of operations that they perform, they must be Pauli's X and Z. And the remainder of the protocol is going to leverage the fact that these provers independently will not tell the difference between when they're asked to perform a CHSH test with the other prover or cases where they might be asked to be doing something else, which is related to the computation that the verifier must do. But all these computations will be embedded in choices of inputs for the verifier that look as if they could have come from the CHSH test. And then the prover will not make the difference, which means that if it wants to succeed in the CHSH test, in case that the test is being performed is a CHSH test, then it must apply the right Pauli operations, X, Z, on the right qubit given by these EPR pairs. And in this way, we'll be able to completely control what the prover does and drive it to perform the computation that we want it to perform. So how is this going to be done? Two more ideas. The first idea is how do we check that the prover prepares a certain state? That's called state tomography. There's a further idea called process tomography where we want to check that the prover or the server applies a certain operation that we want it to apply. It's based on similar ideas. It's a bit more complicated, so I'm not going to explain process tomography, but let's think about state tomography. So let's imagine that I want prover one to create a certain state. This is something that, you know, is part of the circuit for some reason. So what I would do is I would say, well, prover, why don't you prepare this state? 
Um, so I'll tell it the basis of two vectors where psi theta is the state that I'm interested in and psi theta perp is any way to complete uh, the basis. Let's say this is just a single qubit state. And ask the prover to measure, and I'll tell the prover to do it many times, report the outcomes that it gets at each time, and when it gets the correct outcome, psi theta, then tell it to me. And then this is the qubit that we'll use uh, to continue the computation. Now, I want probability half to get each of these outcomes because I'll ask the prover to do this measurement on his half EPR pairs that he is sharing with the second prover, something that I, we tested in the previous slide. Of course, even though this is what I'm asking the prover to do, it can do what it wants. What do I know? That it's making this kind of measurement and on some half of EPR pairs. I need to check this. And here's where I'm going to use prover 2. The idea is that prover 1 knows exactly what's going on, right? I'm telling it to measure in that basis, so it can cheat. But prover 2, I'm just going to keep telling the same thing. I'll keep telling it, prover 2, play CHSH, play CHSH. So I'll tell it, and I'll tell it what inputs it should be playing CHSH with. And Prover 2 has no idea that I stopped telling Prover 1 to play CHSH and instead told it to measure on a certain basis. So Prover 2 is doing exactly the same thing as before, and so it's applying these Pauli measurements on the half of EPR pairs. And now I'm going to check the results, because when Prover 1 tells me that he has obtained state Psi Theta, what does this mean? If it performed the right measurement on the right EPR pair, then it means that what was an EPR pair due to the measurement of prover 1 gets projected down simply to the state psi theta for prover 1, tensor psi theta for prover 2. This is because we're using maximally entangled states. And if prover 2 is indeed in the state psi theta and measures using x or z depending what I asked it to do, it's going to obtain a certain outcome that I can check. For instance, if psi theta was the plus state, and I asked prover 2 to measure in the Hadamard basis, then the outcome should always be 1. Remember, prover 2 has no idea. It doesn't know what's going on. So in case prover 1 lied to me and told me that he managed to prepare the state psi theta, but in fact did something different, then the state of prover 2 will not be psi theta, and I'll be able to detect this in the answers that prover 2 is reporting. So in this way, I'm using prover 2 to check that prover 1 has prepared a certain state psi theta. Okay, off to the third idea. The third idea is to use teleportation. So if you consider what we did in the previous step, prover 1 managed to prepare a certain state psi theta, and we could check that it prepared that state. Now we want a certain computation to be performed on psi theta. And the problem is we can't continue telling prover 1 what is the computation because it already knows what the original state is. And then if we tell it what the computation is supposed to be, it's going to be able to start lying to us. The problem being that although we know psi theta because this is the state that we asked it to perform, we don't know what's going to happen later on in the computation. So we can't hope to check the actions of prover 1 using prover 2 um, based on the same idea at each stage of the protocol. So the idea is going to, to be to do some prover switching. Prover 1 knows that we prepared psi theta, prover 2 has no clue. So what we'll do is now we'll tell prover 1 to teleport psi theta over to prover 2 so that prover 2 will apply a certain gate. And then after prover 2 has applied the gate, maybe h, we'll tell it to teleport the result back to prover 1 and we'll ask prover 1 to apply the next gate. And the point of these teleportations is that the provers are, again, never going to be able to know if they're performing CHSH tests or not, if they're being used to check the other prover or not, and they'll never know what is the state that's being teleported to them. And so the way teleportation is going to be achieved is that, well, we already have EPR pairs between these provers, so prover 1 is going to implement the first part of the teleportation protocol, and we call that these teleportation protocols require correction bits to be applied at prover 2. So prover 1 will give the correction bits to the verifier, who will send back some information to the prover, prover 2, letting it perform the computation, except these teleportation bits will be hidden in a certain way by the verifier using some kind of one-time pad, in a way that the verifier really is the only one who's keeping track of what's going on. So that part of the protocol is 
quite subtle in order to implement uh, correctly. So I'm not giving you all the details, but this is the main idea. You're alternating between using the one prover and the other to perform the computation. The computation is always performed on a state about which the prover has no information at all because it got teleported to it by the other prover. So let's recap. Roughly, I've given you the idea of a protocol that only involves classical interaction between the verifier and two provers. The two provers are quantum. Honest provers are required to share EPR pairs. Dishonest provers can share whatever entanglement they want and perform any computation they want. And this protocol is a blind verifiable protocol for the delegation of any uh, quantum circuit by a purely classical verifier. So that's really the main advantage of the protocol. Now, unfortunately, this protocol also has a number of inconveniences. One of them is that it doesn't have much tolerance to noise. The problem is that we need to perform all these CHSH tests to check all these EPR pairs, and we need to keep quite a good control on the state and the operations that these provers are performing for us. And the, the kind of uh, rigidity results that are known about the CHSH test are not strong enough that we'd be able to tolerate provers that deviate even a little bit from the honest behavior. So this means that when we check the CHSH condition, we'll have to verify not only that it's satisfied up to, say, 84% success probability, but really we'll have to check that it's satisfied up to the optimum minus some epsilon, but epsilon is going to have to be inverse polynomial in n, the size of the quantum circuit. So the noise that we can tolerate goes to zero pretty fast, polynomially fast, with the size of the circuit. And so this means that in practical implementations, it's unlikely that this is going to work out because we can't really expect the quantum server to be uh, that good at succeeding in the CHSH tests. There's also kind of a large efficiency overhead. Um, in the two other protocols that we saw, the total computation and the total interaction required of the verifier were often close to linear in the size of the circuit. Whereas here, the amount of effort communication is polynomial in the size of the circuit, but it's a large polynomial, again, because of all these CHSH tests that need to be performed. And then, of course, the last major drawback of this protocol is that it requires you to interact with two isolated provers, and you need to have a way to gain confidence that these two provers are indeed not talking to each other throughout the duration of your protocol. So it's a big challenge um, in quantum information to overcome these drawbacks and obtain a better protocol for delegation of quantum computation using a purely classical verifier and either more efficient with two provers or ideally uh, with a single quantum prover.